When pain refuses to stop, the chronic shift. Acute pain has a clear job. It protects. A sprained ankle hurts, so you stop running. A cut throbs, so you clean and cover it. That is protection in action. Chronic pain is a different creature. It is the same alarm system, except it malfunctions. The smoke detector that keeps shrieking after the fire is out. Calling it protection without that distinction can mislead. Acute pain is genuine defense. Chronic pain is misprotection. The alarm is not saving you. It is trapping you. For millions, this trap is daily life. The hurt persists long after tissues have healed. Sleep fractures into short, unrestful bits. Work becomes a negotiation with flares. Relationships and plans shrink to avoid uncertainty. The person is not failing to heal. The system that decides when to sound the alarm has learned to over-report danger. This shift is now formalized. Alongside nociceptive pain from tissue injury and neuropathic pain from nerve damage, a third category has entered clinical language, nosoplastic pain. It describes pain that persists for longer than three months without clear evidence of ongoing tissue damage or nerve lesion and is often accompanied by fatigue, sleep disturbance, and disproportionate responses to mild stimuli. Examples include fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, tension type headache, and much chronic low back pain. Naming matters. For decades, people with long lasting pain and clean scans were told the problem was imaginary. Nosoplastic pain says otherwise. The problem is real, not in your head as accusation, but in the system as maladaptive plasticity. The nervous system has amplified its own reflex until protection becomes punishment. That is not weakness or character flaw. It is learning misapplied. Because pain is both biological and personal, the path into chronicity differs across individuals. A stressful year plus a minor injury, a viral illness plus poor sleep, a perfect storm of hormones, workload, and social strain, any of these can tilt the alarm toward chronic. The common thread is a nervous system that starts to predict danger more often than safety. And when the brain predicts threat, pain is its best bet. Chronic does not mean constant. Many live with flares and lulls, spikes that erupt after stress, weather changes, or restless nights. The tissues are not changing hour by hour, but the context is. Recognizing variability helps people stop chasing one hidden injury and start mapping patterns. What turns the alarm up? What helps turn it down? That map is the first tool of prevention. Common missteps at the beginning are understandable. Over-testing can create fear. Over-resting breeds deconditioning. Both strengthen the alarm. The middle path is steadier rule out red flags, share a clear plan, keep daily life moving in scaled doses, and treat fear as part of the injury. When people are given this map early, fewer get lost in chronicity. The Science of Nosoplastic Pain Nosoplastic pain emerges when nociception is altered, plan inputs are labeled dangerous. Clinically, one sees allodynia, pain from gentle touch, or hyperalgesia, exaggerated pain from mild stimuli, non-restorative sleep, brain fog, and widespread tenderness. None of these require ongoing tissue injury to persist. They require a sensitive network. 
For those who want the wiring diagram, neuroimaging shows disrupted communication between the salience network, which tags events as important or dangerous, and the default mode network, which manages self-related processing. Regions like the insula and anterior cingulate cortex, hubs for interoception and emotion, are often overactive, as if the brain were scanning the body with a magnifying glass. The caudate nucleus and thalamus show altered activity, linking motivation and sensory filtering. Functional changes extend down the neuroaxis. In the spinal cord, repeated bombardment from peripheral inputs produces wind-up, a form of temporal summation in which each identical stimulus feels stronger than the last. NMD8 receptor activity rises, inhibitory inner neurons underperform, and the gate to the brain is left ajar. Higher up, the descending modulatory system, circuits from the paraaqueductal gray, or PAG, to the rostroventral medial medulla, or RVM, can shift from inhibition, turning pain down, to facilitation, turning pain up. In short, the system meant to calm pain can flip to amplify it. The immune system is not a bystander. Glial cells, microglia, and astrocytes release cytokines, IL-6, TNF-alpha, that sensitize neurons. In acute healing, this helps. Chronically, it fertilizes pain pathways. Blood markers like CRP can rise during flares, and local immune changes around the dorsal horn keep the amplifier up. This does not mean inflammation is always bad. In some recoveries, a short, decisive immune response appears protective, but if muted or prolonged, it can feed chronicity. Genetics and epigenetics shape vulnerability. Variants in SCN9A for sodium channels, BDNF for synaptic plasticity, and COMT for catecholamine metabolism can shift sensitivity. But genes set the stage, not the script. Stress, sleep, movement, diet, and social support write the performance by altering epigenetic marks, methylation, and histone modifications that tune the system up or down. This is why two people with similar injuries diverge so widely same shared risk, different trajectories. Electrophysiology adds another window. EEG studies find slower peak alpha frequency and altered microstate dynamics in some chronic pain populations, suggesting the resting brain spends more time in patterns that favor vigilance. Conditioned pain modulation, the pain inhibits pain reflex, is often blunted, a sign that descending inhibition is weak. Combined with imaging and immune data, these signals may soon form multimodal biomarkers. No single test diagnoses nosoplastic pain today, but combined models are improving every year. A debated piece of the puzzle is small fiber neuropathy in subsets of patients labeled nosioplastic. Some studies find reduced intraepidermal nerve fiber density despite normal large fiber tests. Others argue this cannot explain widespread symptoms. The safe conclusion is nuanced. In some patients, microstructural loss may contribute, and when present, it deserves treatment. For example, addressing metabolic, autoimmune, or toxic causes. Even then, central sensitivity often remains the main driver. This is not either or. Both layers can coexist and may require parallel strategies. Why the alarm stays on? Central sensitization and fear. The unifying mechanism is central sensitization, turning the gain knob higher. With repetition, the neural ensemble for pain, the neurotag, fires more easily.
The orchestra has rehearsed the tune so often that even a stray note triggers the full piece. Harmless touch becomes painful. A small movement sparks fire. The system, in effect, has learned pain as its default language. Fear locks the volume in place. The fear avoidance cycle is brutal. Pain sparks fear. Fear drives avoidance. Avoidance causes weakness and more sensitivity, which creates more pain, which creates more fear. The person withdraws from stairs, from walks, from friends. The nervous system reads avoidance as proof of danger and raises sensitivity further. Quicksand logic. The harder you struggle, the deeper you sink. Psychological and social lepers are not accessories. They are inputs. Catastrophizing magnifies disability. Anxiety keeps vigilance high. Depression reduces resilience. Loneliness tells the brain, unsafe. Job strain, financial stress, and poor access to care act like background threats. In fact, economic insecurity and lack of social support are potent yellow flags, right alongside fear and poor sleep. Pain is biopsychosocial, and the social part includes wallets, workplaces, and networks. Sleep makes or breaks the cycle. One bad night raises next day pain sensitivity. Chronic insomnia primes the whole system. Alcohol sedates, but fragments sleep. Caffeine sustains vigilance. Food matters too, through energy and inflammation. Language matters too. Degeneration scares. Sensitivity empowers. The brain cares about meaning as much as movement. Purposeful goals beat generic exercise. Walking to a cafe with a friend beats walking a treadmill alone. Reality check. Retraining is possible, but it is not quick. It requires patience, repetition, and setbacks along the way. Progress is often uneven. Two steps forward, one step back. Acknowledging this makes change more sustainable. People who expect fluctuations are less likely to panic during flares and more likely to stay the course. What helps in practice? Three themes recur. Education reduces perceived threat by explaining how alarms misfire, often lowering pain and distress by itself. Movement restores evidence of capability. Graded exposure reintroduces feared tasks in small, safe steps. Sit to stand, stairs, bending, lifting, cycling, jogging. Calming delivers safety signals. Sleep hygiene, breath work, mindfulness, time with supportive people, add pacing to prevent boom and bust, and you have a workable framework you can personalize with a clinician or coach. Clues for the future, biomarkers, prevention, and hope. If nociplative pain reflects learned sensitivity, two strategies matter most, prevention and retraining. Prevention begins early. After injury or surgery, protect sleep, keep moving in gentle increments, and set expectations honestly. People do best when they learn that some pain during healing is expected and safe, that gentle activity nourishes recovery, that fear and catastrophizing derail it. Clinics should screen for red flags, fractures, infections, nerve compromise, but also for yellow flags, fear, depression, poor sleep, job stress, financial insecurity, and poor access to care. Addressing these early lowers the chance that a temporary problem becomes permanent. Retraining uses converging tools. Pain neuroscience education reframes danger as sensitivity in clear language. Graded exposure breaks avoidance by reintroducing feared tasks stepwise. Each success supplies a prediction error that tells the brain this is safe. Exercise-induced hypoalgesia adds a physiologic bonus. 
after activity, many people feel less pain as endogenous opioids and endogenous cannabinoids shift the balance. The effect is not universal. Widespread pain like fibromyalgia may blunt that effect, which is why programs are personalized rather than one size fits all. Two structured approaches integrate these elements. Cognitive functional therapy blends movement with belief change and behavioral experiments. A therapist identifies unhelpful narratives, then guides specific movements while reshaping the story, from fragile to capable. Pain reprocessing therapy focuses on reinterpretation of sensations as safe, often using somatic tracking and exposure to feared feelings. Early randomized trials are promising, replication and long-term follow-ups will clarify how durable the benefits are and which patients benefit most. Future directions target prediction itself. The predictive coding view treats pain as the brain's best guess under uncertainty. Treatments aim to update those guesses. Expectation violation exercises challenge old predictions by proving safety in controlled conditions. Virtual reality creates vivid but safe mismatches that help rewrite priors. Mindfulness and acceptance reduce the brain's tendency to overfit danger, increasing flexibility and reducing distress. Measurement is evolving too. Function-based outcomes, walking distance, sit to stand, carry capacity, patient-specific functional scale, matter more than a single 0 to 10 pain score. Tracking sleep, steps, baseline activity, flare triggers, and recovery time turns guesswork into feedback. Relapse planning is part of success. Flares are inevitable. The goal is to shorten, soften, and learn from them. A written plan, what I do on flare day, removes panic and keeps the system from resetting to fear. None of this is a universal cure, but it is real progress. Where once the options were opioids, surgery, or surrender, there is now a broader set. Education, movement, cognitive and behavioral therapies, protective rebalancing, and emerging biomarker-guided strategies. Chronic pain is staggered because learning is powerful. Relief is possible for the same reason. Chronic pain is not weakness and not illusion. It is a protector gone rogue, loud, disruptive, but modifiable. Understanding nociplative pain gives leverage. With patience and the right tools, the alarm can be retuned. The path is not easy and progress is rarely linear, but it is possible and possibility is enough to begin. Pain isn't an enemy to be conquered. It's a teacher who lost his volume control. Listening instead of fighting is where real recovery begins. Layer by layer, nerve by nerve. Next episodes, we'll dive into the science of pain memory, the biology of hope, and how even small daily rituals can rewire the nervous system. Until then, move, breathe, Listen, because silence sometimes heals louder than medicine. Paper Loud, where science meets soul. Take care.